G'day guys, welcome back to Supercoach with DR and welcome to my first official team reveal for 2024. Hope you've been well, absolutely pumped, absolutely excited to get into this. You probably noticed the background is a little bit different to the usual videos. I'm at my folks holiday house in Nagambia at the moment, so shout out to any fellow Nagambians that may be out there. But look, this is the issue at the moment. I'm meant to be enjoying this holiday with the boys. You know, we, we, look, we have been fishing, a bit of bike riding, got the pool in the backyard, all been awesome. But the issue is I've just constantly been daydreaming about Supercoach ever since it opened. What was it, a day, two days ago now? It's like all the days have mashed into one. You know, I was sitting in the pool before, boys got the volleyball going on. I should be getting involved in the fun here, but it's like they're just going in slow motion. I'm staring into space just thinking about this side. So usually I've got a bit of structure to these type of videos, but it's pretty much going to be off the top of the dome here. Not, not the actual team itself. I've got a pretty good idea about what the first team's going to be looking like. But in regards to what I talk about, sort of go through on the video, I'm really not too sure. We'll just sort of get into it. We'll obviously talk a little bit about my strategy going into this year, the structure I'm looking to implement, some lessons learned last year. I don't want to make the same mistakes again this year, but it is a very, very different game because of a number of reasons this year. But before I get into it, uh, I suppose we'll do a couple of housekeeping things. If you haven't seen this video already, make sure that you do yourself a favor, even pause this video now and go back to it. I had the absolute honor and privilege of sitting down with Selby, AKA Moira's Magic, the absolute goat of fantasy and super coach these days as well. We're talking about a two-time fantasy winner, two years in a row. The garage wasn't big enough for another Hilux. He then takes a little bit of a break, this great man, decides to put out some content and then gives Supercoach a go. Seventh overall in his first real season of Supercoach. Follows it up last year with another top 300 finish. But best of all, this man, the absolute GOAT, the man with the most knowledge in the game, puts out a season guide each year and that includes podcasts, etc. But this is the best pre-season guide that you can get your hands on. I'm actually giving a free giveaway of that particular guide, you need to check out the video that I'm talking about here. I will link it in the description below, the video I did with Selby on how to actually enter the draw. But uh, the more people, the better. We'll do a random draw, uh, maybe in the next two days. We'll say two day time limit, and then we'll actually draw that, which should be a lot of fun. So uh, make sure that you do check that out. In regards to other content this year, well, I'll obviously be getting together with the Sword Play crew. Again, my brother's Jonathan Spills. And best thing of all, not only will the Sword Play potty be on YouTube, we're also going to Spotify as well. Get some merch out there, some fun sort of stuff. You're getting the usual stock take, uh, stock take, geez, stock market videos uh, each and every week, hopefully bigger and better than always as well. And also pre-season content. We're doing all A-team team previews and I'll be teaming up with some of the best and most entertaining content creators in the land. Uh, for example, I'll give you a couple of clues for the two legends I'm getting on for the Richmond team preview. Um, this is a really obvious one. Uh, I just can't have come it down about one of the guys that I'll be getting on and uh, should be a swizzling good time as well. A couple of legends there just look forward to for one of the team previews. But uh, as I said, apart from that, usual team uh, reviews each week and all the rest. But um, look, what do I talk about now? Um, do we talk about the elephant in the room? Very quickly, look, I don't want to bang on about this, right? But we know what the element uh, the elephant, sorry, in the room is, and that's the fact that we're now getting 40 trades. There's been a bit of drama, to say the least, on X, and I don't think there's too many people on the fence about this. You either absolutely hate it or you absolutely love it. Depends what type of player you are. Now, the argument may be that it's catering more for the casual type crowd rather than traditionalists. I'm really not too sure. I don't know the reasons behind why certain decisions have been made. Um, but what I do know is that the blokes like Tim and, and Al Payton, who have been copying a little bit of personal abuse, they are some of the most passionate super coach people in the game. So whatever decisions have been made, remember, a lot of the time it may be above these guys' head. Uh, it's, well, for what the company thinks is for the betterment of the game. So whether or not you agree with it or you don't, I suppose that we're all on the same level playing field. Uh, but personally, if you ask me, what do I really think about the 40 trades? To be honest, I am more of a traditionalist. Like when it was only 24 trades, I had some of my best rankings ever, you know, multiple top hundreds. I enjoyed the game, I suppose, a little bit more when there was only the 24 trades and I had my best results then. So 
in a perfect world, I would like to lower the trades as much as possible. I think it punishes bad starting teams. But if you look at my year last year, I had a terrible, terrible starting side. And uh, without some of the boosts and the new changes in rules, I wouldn't have been able to claw my way to a top 2000 finish. So there's different ways of looking about it, but purely from the heart as a traditionalist, traditionalist, I like less trades. I think less trades are better, but the game has evolved. This is the thing. And look, I know that COVID may be a little bit of a thing of the past, but there had to be different adaptions to that. Some people are calling it fantasy light. Um, look, there's yeah, a bit of banter about it, but uh, whatever you, or however you feel about it, we need to live with it and just move forward. But just with some of these personal attacks, it's just not on. You know, some people have really crossed the line, in my opinion. I, If you know me and you've been following me, I'm not someone that ever gets involved in the politics, right? But I have had to make a couple of comments. Um, I've even been accused of uh, brown eyeing the blokes from Supercoach. You realise that they won't give you more trades, DR, this type of stuff. But I just didn't like the personal type of tax. And look, I'm all for great discussion, right? This is one of the best things about the game. And this is another thing that Selby mentioned on the video is one of the most well enjoyable aspects in, in our opinion anyway is a discussion about the game and you don't have to agree with everyone some of the best discussion is when you do disagree you get a bit of a different viewpoint but you need to do it respectfully that's all that i'd ask i'm not going to bang into things and that's a great thing about um you know for example the super coach with dr members group we give each other absolute crap but it's always in a fun and, and lovable type way. And uh, we will have a new tier of membership as well. And all money does go to charity for that. So we'll talk about that in another video. Not gonna get into that stuff because we wanna keep positive with this. And um, we want to start sharing some more love in the super coach community. I think particularly on X, uh, there's some wonderful people on there. And as I said, I'll be having some of these great people on the channel as well. But uh, look, where do I go? Look, I've talked about the 40 trades. Um, look, let's actually start to lock in this team. You know, let's get positive, as I said, all in the same playing field, we're all level. So uh, what I'll do is I'm gonna start to lock in this team. We'll talk about the strategy. I'll talk about the players that are pretty much on my watch list. There's a couple of placeholder type picks here that you'll see in a little bit. And uh, with the 40 trades, I have had to shift a couple of things slightly, but one thing I am gonna certainly do this year is back my gut. And just very quickly, if I look back to my original team review that I did or team reveal that I did last year, well, Fast forward to actual round one when I started my side, I end up with Ridley, Doherty and someone else. Who do I have and back my gut with? The first side that I actually put out there, it was actually Sicily, Dacos and Dawson. So if I'd have actually backed my gut, would have had a much more successful season, particularly a much more successful start to the season. We can't always get it right, but uh, we'll do our best to go as well as we can this year. So I know that I've banged on for this intro. Let's start to create this side. Let me know what you think. All right, now let's start to lock in some players and talk a little bit of strategy here. Now, as I mentioned before, I had a bit of a terrible starting side and it killed my season last year. Why was it such a bad starting side? Well, I think that I went with a little bit of mid-price madness. I think I went over the top with that. Some real failed picks there early on, you know. And some of these blokes actually turned out okay. Your Wangane Miller, your Flanders at the end of the season. It just wasn't their time to start off the season. So one thing I'm looking to do this year is go back to more of a guns and rookies approach. Now, this may be a little bit more controversial given the fact that we have been given extra trades. People are calling Supercoach Fantasy Light now. And possibly many people may be switching towards more of a value type approach. I may be getting it wrong here, going more your guns and rookies. I think there are other ways to use the four trades rather than, well, four extra trades this is, rather than purely focusing on going more of that value approach. Again, I may be getting it totally wrong, and this is why I'll be chatting with blokes like Selby and getting that season guide to try to get a really nice balance to the side. But again, going back to last year, I didn't back my gut with some of these picks. I listened to some of the group talk, the group hype, and it killed me at the end of the day. I need to back my own gut. I'm going to live and die by my decisions. I'm going to put my ideas out there. And again, I never call myself an expert. I'm going to get some of these wrong. I'm sure about that. But hopefully I get a few right as well. It's all game, all fun at the end of the day. So more of a guns and rookies type approach. I'm not looking at anyone pretty much over 400K that I'm going to select in my side that I'm not going to assume is going to be a keeper. 
That's why I'm looking at the moment. So between that sort of maybe four to 500K mark, that's really an area that I'm not going to look at this year. Again, could be controversial because if you look at fantasy, is that the sort of area that you do target? It may be. So I may be wrong here, but let's go. Now, Nick Dacos, 59% so far. I can see why. Nicky baby, Nicky boy, an absolute gun. And he's a bloke that... A, you need in your side at some stage during the season. I would be just flabbergasted if he didn't finish top three as a defender for this year, for example. Even in the midfield, he could be push pushing a really top average there. So I love Dacos as a selection, but if I look at his opening fixture, he's someone that obviously does have the two buys. He's got that round five buy coming off Finn. Sydney, we know that Clark isn't there, but do they implement a tag with somebody else, giving him a fair bit of attention because it did work out when Clark did it? I'm not too sure. We don't have a crystal ball here, but given the fact he's 650, he's the highest price defender at the moment. I'm actually happy to skip him. Now, do we want him sooner rather than later? Absolutely we do. But for now, I don't think that he's going to get out of range early. That's just a prediction that I'm making again could be completely wrong. If he does get out of reach early, then this could be a bit of a problem for me. But at this stage, I'm going to back my gut on that and I'm going to skip him. I'm going to, however, lock in James Sicily and Tommy Stewart, who are the next two most expensive defenders. Now, these two, I think, I'm not going to say lock because a lot of things could happen here. But again, I'd be really, really surprised if they were not at a bare minimum top six in their position by the end of the year. So I really think that this is pretty much how it's going to pan out. Just say our day cost Sicily Stewart, one, two, three, not including another bloke who I think is absolute value this year. I'm also going to select in my side next. But apart from these two, Stuart and Sicily, Luke Ryan got a really, really nice fixture. That's something else that definitely needs to come into our strategy. And that's definitely something that I'm going to take into account this year is the fixture. Some people may be a little bit more laid back, given the fact we've got those four extra trades and maybe select a couple of other blokes that will have the two buys and, and play that round zero game. It's up for debate what you're going to do with those extra four trades, but with at least one of them, I'm looking to do a bit of a, you might call it a radical type move. It's in the midfield, so we'll see when we get there. But uh, Jack Sinclair, again, should be certainly up there. Dan Houston is a bloke that I actually really like, and he's a pod that certainly could enter my side. So I'm not going to discount Dan Houston. If I need a little bit of extra cash, it may be even a, a Stewart down to a Houston. I like Sicily more than a Stewart, so it would be Stewart down to Houston if I need to do that. Uh, Sheasel was in my original side when I when the team picker came out, but yeah, questions about role, second year player, I'm probably not going to go there now. Who I am going to go for though, and I think this bloke should be a lock, and I did a little bit of a short uh, guess a player first selected player in my side. It's actually this bloke here. It's Hayden Young. I'm not going to go right into the pick because there's going to be so much talk about this bloke. There's already been a lot of talk about this bloke. He's just an absolute lock playing through that midfield. I think he's pretty much going to be midfield only, straight out midfielder. And this bloke has absolutely been dominating the preseason. Real standout there. So really happy to select Hayden Young. I think he's got potential to be top three in defence. So for me, if I'm giving my rankings at the moment, my top four, Dacos, Sisley, Stewart and Young. So in my opinion, if I can get three of them at the moment and sort of skip that higher price player who I'm hoping can come down a little bit in price and present a tad more value, then that would be absolutely ideal. Who knows, but that's where we're going at the moment. We're then going to go all the way down. Now, I hate selecting this bloke, but I think we've just got to. It's Zach Williams. I think the pick pretty much speaks for itself. Risk versus rewards. The risk is pretty much out, outweighed here by A, the really, really low price and the potential for your return here. We know that on his best day, we saw what he did in that grand final. He's an absolute elite halfback of the comp. The major issue is obviously the bloke just cannot stay in the park, but at that price, I'm happy to take the gamble. I think most people should and will as well. Now we do have some rookies. I'm not going to go through all the options because I think I've probably rambled on already. So I'm pretty much just going to start to lock in a few blokes here. Uh, at the moment, I'm going with Josh Gibkiss. So at 150K, I don't know exactly what his role is going to be, but that's cheaper than what he's priced at 
in his rookie year. We know that he was obviously injured last year, didn't play a game. That's why we see him all the way down here at 150K. So I'm okay with that at the moment. Is he a bloke that we want on field? Again, we just need to wait on it. But at this stage, I'm pretty happy to go there. You'll notice that I'm also skipping Dan Curtin. Now, I've got a bit of a knee issue at the moment. I know that the Crows aren't too worried or that's what they're saying. So I just think at this stage, there may be a little bit more value to him because I'm getting a couple of those high price rookies in my midfield. So through Gibkiss, we'll see how this bloke goes and if he gets a game. But I don't know if Lever's traveling too well at the moment. There may actually be a spot for him. He's made his way back onto the list and it's Marty Hall. So again, in the right role, I think he could score well enough to actually be on our bench here. So at this stage, I'm pretty much happy to lock the whore in. Love to have a whore in the side. From then on, I think this bloke's going to be a really, he's not Tony, he is Toby, Toby Pink. I think he's going to be a really popular selection. Now, there's been a little bit of conjecture whether or not he's actually going to be in there 22. There was a bit of talk that he's actually going to be the bloke or is in front to replace McKay or McKay. I always get that one wrong, but uh, Buckets, I think the nickname is. So Buckets obviously gone now. There's been a bit of talk that this bloke could be that guy. Uh, will he be? I don't know. So we'll need to wait on it, but I just think that he's a pretty easy placeholder to have there at the moment. And the other bloke that I'm going to select here, oh, I've just got rid of Toby. Sorry, mate. Is another player, I think he was top 10, it was a top 15 draft pick, made his way across from the Saints, and that's Nick Coffield. So again, one of those players could certainly replace a Gibkus or a Hoare on field. I don't know what Bevo's going to do, but I think he's going pretty well, tracking well in the preseason, similar to someone like a Zach Williams, a pretty promising type player. Well, he's no Zach Williams, so he's achieved nothing that close to what a Zach Williams has. But in his own right, the similarity here is that both talented players, but just cannot get their body right and get on the field. So hopefully that change of scenery, change of environment, maybe a change of medical staff, that's no dig at St Kilda whatsoever there. Wouldn't have a clue what goes on there, but uh, sometimes this is the best thing in the world for a player. He's got the potential i'm hoping he can secure maybe a half back role who knows could he push onto a wing i'm not too sure at this stage he could get bevoed but at 123k i'm pretty much happy to go there so i've gone with the three premiums there who i think will be elite keepers for me williams i think you've got to select and then we're looking at the rookies there and i think these guys should all present pretty nice value give me at least at 150k let's just say and again with the 40 trades traditionally we think that a trades, well, I'm in the camp that a trades varied at around that 150K mark. That could come down with those extra four. Do we look to move a couple of rookies on potentially earlier? Well, that's what I'll most likely have to do, given the fact I'm going more of a guns and rookies approach. So that's the defensive line. Let's get into the midfield. So this may be a little bit controversial. Now, I have not looked at any team uploads or team reveals yet from any of the other content creators. I'm really looking forward to doing that, but I want to really go into this unbiased. And I'm guessing, this is just an absolute guess, but I might be even close to a lone wolf here. I don't know if anyone else is even going to go for this man in the content creating community, but I'm prepared to back my gut. I put out a video that went for a good 25 to 30 minutes, a deep dive player profile, and I gave all my reasons for selecting this bloke. I tried to make it a balanced view or a balanced approach. Certainly went through the cons and there are cons to this pick. He's the highest priced player in the game. He's coming off a bit of a pre-season cleanup. We say pre-season surgery, but I'm looking at it more of a cleanup. I'll go through all this in the video. It's obviously Marcus Bonson-Pally. Sorry, Brent, you're calling me at the moment, blokus. I'm just doing this video, mate, so we'll get back to you when I can, mate. Uh, but back to the bond. One thing that I think is a little bit underrated is your captaincy option. Now, we've certainly got loops this year through the buys, so I'm not starting a loop. I'm a big advocate for normally starting a loop. We don't have to this year. So some people may say having two bites of the cherry even without that loop, you don't really need that reliable captain. You could select, say, your butters type and somebody else. Go back to the Bond video, and I will be doing a Butters profile. I'm about three quarters of the way through it at the moment. I'll go through some captaincy numbers there. This bloke, along with Tim English in the rucks, we'll see if I'm going to select him when I get there. For me anyway, are the two clear standout captain options week upon week. Bond went under 100 once last year, and that was an 89. We look at the ceiling. He's got the best captain ceiling in the competition. 
We know that blokes like Sicily on their good day can give you a really nice score, the 170 type scores. But if you go back to that video, take a look at those scores. If you want to just lock in a safe captain from week to week, then I think Bond's got to be a man if you're not going for Tim English. Now, back in the day, we had no problem paying up 700, 750K for Gorn back in, was it 2021, I'm going to say? 2020, it was Grundy, I think 700K plus. For these rucks, the old set and forget. What's wrong with setting and forget a midfielder like a Bond? I think he's the best of the best. If you look at consistency, the bloke has gone 100 plus 41 out of his last 45 games, being the last two home and away seasons in Supercoach. Talk about consistency, crazy. And history does suggest, in one of the cons, that it's very rare that the highest scoring player in the game can back that up and maintain it. But I think if anyone can, it's this man, Marcus Bonson Pally. I love the bloke. I'm not going to ramble on too much more about him in this video because I did do that pretty much, yeah, deep dive player review. So enough on the bond. Absolutely selecting this man in the side. Now, the next bloke that I would actually really love to get here is this man here, Tom Liberatore. He, could he be an alternative to a bond? Possibly. Now, he's at 4% at the moment. So I really, really like that ownership. So there may be a stage where bond enters a side. Not too sure at the moment. This guy, I think, now, again, talk about some cons there are certainly some cons to this pick but i'll tell you what a little bit of a preview into the uh selby's mora's magic pre-season guide i think you'll see some nice numbers for this man particularly if we focus towards the end of the season now if you can get over the fact that it's a huge risk durability wise this bloke again just can't get his body right difference between a williams type and let's just say that the caulfield type i've selected down back is the price this is a big risk because we're paying up for this man. But talent-wise, if you look at price projection, if you look at scoring patterns, he can be one of the best of the best and one of the absolute uber elite. So I've just got my fingers crossed that he gets his body right. We know that he may be a burn man for lots of people last year. I never owned him last year. We know about the laid out and all that drama. But I just, the upside to this guy, apart from that durability, which is a huge downside, is massive for me. So at this stage, I'm quite happy to lock this young star in. I really think he could take his game to another level. Now, when it comes to the 40 trades, this is where I'm going a little bit funky. And this is where we can talk a little bit about strategy here. Now, you notice so far with the Sicily, Stuart, Young, Bonson, Pally, and LDU, that none of these blokes will play round zero. So only one buy for the year. Uh, Fremantle and Port have a fantastic buy. You've got Young there so far. We are going to select a Port player in a sec, actually. I think he may be, is he priced at a higher price than this man? Yeah, all right. We'll quickly just get this bloke in. I'm not going to talk too much again because I'm going to do a player profile video on him. Now, the downside to, to Butters is last year he had a huge spike in CBAs, which I'll talk about in the video. But there has been news again that, uh, what's his name? Oh, Ollie Wines, the ex Brownlow medalist, had Rosie in my head. Ollie Wines, he only had around 50% CBAs last year. This is just from memory. This year, they see him as pretty much getting back to what he does best, and that's as a pure inside mid. So you had Boak last year, only had your 13%. Doesn't really affect someone like him. So it was really Butters and Rosie, the two main men there. You chuck your Wines in, what happens with a Willem Drew, for example? They want other players. You've got your Horn Francis as well, which is a huge addition to their CBAs. I think it was 48% or high 40s, mid 40s last year. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with that mix. I don't think it's an absolute guarantee that Butters CBAs continues to rise. I must admit that that was probably the expectation for me. But with this Wines news, I won't say that it spooked me whatsoever. I'm going to lock this man in. Really like his prospects. One of the most exciting players in the comp. Love to watch him, but you've sort of got your hands over your eyes at the same time with his kamikaze style. Just look after yourself, Zachy. Don't go in too hard, son. Maybe just 90% rather than 100, but he won't change his game. But yeah, huge fan of Butters. Won't go on too much. Pretty much going to lock him in. Let's get to the bloke that there was no way I was going to select. But I've got a little bit of a plan at my sleeve here. So this is going to be one of your classic flips. Now, when I say classic flips... For me, I wouldn't say it's a classic because I never do this type of stuff. I never look to do this. It can be very risky as well. But here's my method to the madness behind starting with Tom Green 
and what I'm looking to do with Tom Green. So he's obviously got a really, really early buy. We all, we all know about that. So it's going to be round three. Round zero, he's obviously going to play. One, two, he plays. So you're going to get three games. Remember, round zero doesn't count for super coach. Prices do, but the score doesn't. So you're going to get two scores from him. But in that round two game, his price would have hopefully, fingers crossed, increased by then. Then he's got his buy. So given the fact his early draw is absolutely delicious, I don't really care about what happens in round zero. I'd like him to get a nice score, obviously, so that his price goes up. I'll get at least one price rise or I'll get one price rise from him. But it's that North game and it's the West Coast game. I don't know which way around it is, but that's going to be his round one and round two opponent. And let's be honest, no disrespect to the two teams, but if you're a super coach midfielder, then these are the teams that hopefully we're going to see your ceiling. And I just love this bloke as a player. Am I wasting trades? Potentially, but I'd love to actually bring him back in if I do trade him out, which is the plan at this stage. So I would even like to captain him. So I've got my Bont there already, who's going to be a just lock and load VC or C captain each week. While I've got Green in the side, he's going to be super, super tempting as well, particularly with his early ceiling uh, potential, let's just say. If he didn't have that bad buy, I guarantee you that 75% of the comp would lock him in. I won't guarantee that, but that's just my feel anyway. He would be such a popular pick. It's the buyers are putting him off. But my plan is to get those nice early scores. Hopefully, fingers crossed, see a nice price rise. I think he's break even over those first two games, or not including round zeros, around 107. So that's, for me, totally unders. I think he can go better than that. Let's take advantage of those early scores. And this comes into the strategy part. Now, this is why I need to go back and have a look at the video where I took a chat with Selby. I sat down and have a chat with Selby. One thing that he mentioned, and this is something that really opened up my mind in a way, was the fact that if you do miss a nice mid-pricer, if you're potentially going with that more guns and rookies approach, then you can always go down. So with Tom Green, my plan with him is to actually go down. You'll see with my remaining salary, that's not the ideal amount at the moment, but I will have a couple of placeholders get an easy extra 100K in the bank if I need to. So a lot could happen here, but this is my plan. I'll say straight out that I'm not going to start Sam Walsh. That may be absolutely crazy in some people's opinions. Do I love Sam Walsh? Absolutely. Do I want him in my side? Yes, I do. Great value, 100%. So the idea is I'm going to start with a green, and then this is going to give me the capability to go down to someone like a Sam Walsh. It's actually perfect timing when you align their buys. Walsh will have the buy, Green actually plays, Green goes to the buy, Walsh comes back before that price rise. Absolutely magnificent with me. It works out so well. You'll get that data on Walsh. Is he actually the man that we think he's gonna be? If so, which I think he is, it's pretty easy lock and you actually make a little bit of coin there. Hopefully, who knows, there's no guarantees, but that's the plan. The other plan could be, I've seen, a lot of chatter about your Carl Amon types. A bit of chatter about your Matty Crouch types. Originally in my side, I had Cam Guthrie, for example, along with Matty Crouch. Being the more guns and rookies approach this year, I'm looking at blokes that I'm selecting, apart from Tom Green with a little bit of strategy here, for blokes that are going to be in my final starting side. Will the likes of, of Crouch, Guthrie, certainly not, I don't think... We can say that at all. Um, and a couple of the other blokes that I've mentioned already, will they be in our final starting sides? Crouch maybe give you good enough average to be your M8, possibly, and you may be happy with that, absolutely. But if you look here so far, your Cicely Stewart, your Bont, and then you go down to your elder U Butters types picks, we are paying a lot here, but there's the, I'm not going to have to select these blokes or stress about bringing these blokes into my side because I'm starting with them. Not selecting a bond, how are you going to get him in? What's your plans? It could be to use those extra trades. If that's your plan, great. But I'm not going to want to stress about that. I could have some stress with Dacos if he goes off early. But my plan is to get as many players in right from the start that I won't have to stress about. The type of blokes that have the potential to get right out of reach. And by the time you think about things, you're like, well, I just there's no way to get to them because I've now got to look for a bit more value because there's other areas that I also need to upgrade. I want to start with them. I may get punished. 
I may lose cash and I know that Bond's going to lose cash at some stage, but due to his consistency, I hope that he's going to stay there. So that's another thing I'm taking into account with my picks. So the great thing about Tom Green is that I can go down to Walsh, who I think is definitely going to be a keeper in our midfields if you want to go there, or else I can go down to a Matt Crouch, to a Guthrie, to a Cal Amon type, who is red hot, I think, with lots of people at the moment. I've got the ability to do that from a Tom Green. As Selby said, it's so much easier to go down rather than find the money to go up. So if a couple of these blokes don't work, or if even one of these blokes don't work, you're in such an awkward spot early on. I know we've got some round zero data and all the rest, depending on what players you're looking to select, but that's a big part of my strategy. Starting with Green, banking those early points, and I'm just gonna go shopping. That's gonna be one way that I'm gonna use one of those extra four trades. Just my own strategy there. Other people may be doing it. And if anyone's put out a team review and they're doing the same thing, apologies. I promise not, I'm not copping you. All right, this is one of my daydreaming pool ideas. Because I've always been a big fan of selecting Tommy Green. So that's the way that I'm going there at the moment. So he's the only player so far premium wise that don't have the ideal buyer structure. When I mean by ideal, there's better buyers than others, but won't have two buyers. I'll just have the single buy. The next player we're going to go here and I would actually love to bring in the Schlong, M8 the Schlong, Caleb Sarong, but I'm going to go with this teammate. And I think, again, he's going to be a really solid selection. And it's Andy Brayshaw. You'll notice another bit of a theme here. He's pretty much next-gen type players. Now, I know that Cicely and Stewart are pretty much our stalwarts here, but Young, certainly next-gen here, along with your LDU, your Butters, your Green, your Brayshaw. I think that's where I'm going this year. I've got no faith in the Clary. Don't know what's going to happen with the Clary. A Lockie Neal type. I don't love Brisbane's fixture, but even if I did, I'm going next-gen. He won the Brownlow and all the rest. We know that, but I just like the, the, the new style of player that are really coming into their prime, about to hit their peak, and obviously players that I think will have a really, really decent buy. So they're really going to be my five main premium midfielders here. We've got the Bon, LDU, Butters, Green, as well as Andy Brayshaw. Now we're going to bring in a couple of rookies here, and these are going to be really, really popular players. And I think, I'm not going to say must have, but I think it'd be pretty much crazy, at least if you didn't have, have them in your side at this stage, and it's Colby McKercher. And the other really obvious one here is Riley Sanders. So both blokes here have been lighting it up in the preseason. So McKercher, he's hopefully looking for one of those half-back roles. Again, we've got a number of players that could be looking to do that. You go to your Fisher, a bit of a hamstring setback. Don't know exactly what's going on with him there. Uh, you've got your Bergman type. So there are a few blokes that definitely could demand the role, but he's certainly got the talent. He really has been lighting heads I think it was, I forget what the exact quote was, like what the hell is going on here with this bloke from Dry Simpkin, just amazed with what he's producing just in your preseason match sims and all the rest. So McCurchard, definite uh, in for me at the moment. And then his Sanders, again, been turning heads. And this is very stereotypical preseason type stuff, but genuinely, I think this bloke could be a star and actually demand a little bit of midfield time. He has been spending some time there in the drills. So McCurcher and Sanders, I think, are going to be fantastic picks and very happy to pay up at the moment. The next fella has also been getting a little bit of a pre-season hype up, and it's Jeremy Sharp. So obviously a wing spot, sorry, just clicking him, just a wing spot available there with Henry gone. So I think he's leading the race at the moment, all the match sims. He's been there, performing well, producing some good form. So I think he's a pretty easy selection, probably more on your bench, I think, than on field, but let's just see what happens there. I know they've been keen on him for a couple of years also. Uh, the next bloke we're going to get is Mana. So lit it up in the VFL, I think one of the finals at six goal performance here. So talented type player. Does he actually get a role in the best 22 come round one? I don't really know. It's really tough to get info out of Geelong. So we'll wait and see there. But I think he's a nice DPP type player, mature age type pick, the sort of bloke that if he does get a game, I think can have an impact pretty much straight away. I think that's why they got him as well. Is it more of a backup or on field? Let's just wait and see. But I think a really nice placeholder for us there at the moment. Now, we've got a few options here. Uh, I will go with Jai Clark for now. 
really talented type player. I think the one game that he played, it was an injury affected game. But what do we look to see at Geelong? You see two Geelong players here, but again, Manor has DPP. I'll Pretty easy switch with a couple of votes up forward. But what do we expect from Clark? Well, hopefully some early games. I am, again, looking for some new gen start type stuff here. Are they going to roll with your danger fields, your Guthries? Uh, I really just don't rate Parfit. You've got your bows that could go through there. O'Connor types, you're going to have Blitzarves in there at the moment. If they're going to go with that true ruck, he's could play a feature in there or could feature in there. So I really don't know what's going to happen with Clark. But, again, early type draft pick, got the talent. Hope, hope, you know, pretty happy to just leave him on the bench at the moment. And then I think the last bloke we'll select here, there's been some decent reports coming out of West Coast, and it's Clay Hall. So in the match sims, he's actually been playing a lot of midfield time. So I think it was Rhino Daniels that tweeted out that he's a bit of an inside ball, he's a midfielder only. So who knows? There should be spots up for grabs there at West Coast. And if he's in the main sessions there playing that role, a little bit of competition we know. But if he gets an early game at 117k playing through that midfield, I think he's got the potential to score well. So if you look at that midfield there, we've really got the five premiums, the two high price rookies, and then that third on-field spot could be a sharp manner, Clark or Hall. Hopefully they'll all score well. But uh, in the rucks, I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time, to be honest. Now, I think there's five blokes that you look at here. You look at Tim English, look at Rowan Marshall, you look at Max Gorn, you don't just look at, you lock in Brody Grundy, and then it might be Cherry. Now, I may be imagining this, but I reckon my eyes scroll past that Cherry had some sort of an injury. I don't know how much he's going to be affected by it. Anyway, I just, I'm deciding not to go Cherry. As I said, I don't really like that mid-price approach. And the other issue I've got with starting at Cherry, and I said this anyway in my original video, is the fact that if things don't go right, you pretty much don't have an exit plan. You need to go all the way down somewhere if you're lucky, or you need to find money to go up. And how do you find money? Well, you've pretty much got to colour premium, don't you? Or else maybe a failed mid-pricer. Wait and see on that. But too much of a risk for me at the moment. Now, English, there has been so many issues, it seems, with him in the pre-season. But people played them up too much, being downplayed. I'm not too sure. But at the price, I'm just not looking to go there at the moment. Rowan Marshall, I think, certainly could have top two aspirations this year. But again, I'm not paying up that much. I'm going to keep it pretty simple. And this is, I'm guessing, going with a lot of the crowd here, a lot of, I think, particularly the content creating crowd, and that's just to go with Gorn. I think this is just a safe combination. And then obviously a Brody Grundy. So that's a really easy combination for me. Are we going to get a playing R3? Well, a few things may need to change if we do, if it's going to be that Conway type pick at this stage. And I don't think he's going to get early games. So I really don't know at this stage what I'm going to do with the R3, but it's certainly not going to be a loophole player if possible. Even a player like Anae Smith that may not play regular football, but a backup, a first backup type to someone like Anae. But then again, you've got a Samson Ryan, who knows? But it's Nay Smith at the moment, but I think with Gorn and Grundy, really easy locks. Gorn, I view more as a keeper for the year. Grundy, I certainly think, has keeper potential. What we'll need to wait and see is what's the difference going to be in average between your Grundy, Gorns, English, and Marshall. So I think it will be pretty obvious, maybe come round five or six. Even with Grundy, you may want to flip him before his buy. There's a lot of things that you could do, but we'll get a little bit of data anyway, and I think a bit of a feel for how these guys are going to pan out, their average out. Draws come into it and all the rest, but that's pretty much my plan at the moment. And I would love to be able to just lock these two in for the whole season, we'll have to wait and see. But that is the ruck line at the moment. Now, as we know, I'm not you know, telling you anything you don't know here. The forward line is absolute carnage. I do not like it. So we'll go back how much. We're not spending much here. Yeah, just over 2 mil. So just under 2.2 .2 mil. So what are we going to do here? I think this one is pretty easy. It's Jack McRae. Now, do I love McRae's selection? No. Do I trust Bevo? No. Do I know exactly what his role is going to be come the season proper? No. But when we look at other names here, Dogger Jackson, he's not going to be rucking anymore. It's going to be the Shrek. Uh, it's going to be Shrek Darcy. He's not travelling too well in the preseason Shrek. So who knows? If it's looking like Shrek's out for an extended period of time, this would be pretty much my first selected forward, Dogger Jackson. But at this point, I'm just not because I see him more as a key forward. Kerno, key forward. Bolton. 
almost guarantee you that you'll be able to get this bloke at some stage of the season, at least bare minimum at the 500 mark because he's got a really low floor. And saying that, could start off hot. And I could, I could see a world, if he gets that midfield role, that he's in the top six by the end of the year. Could see a world there. Don't know who's going to get DVP and all the rest. But talented player. But due to his low floor, I think he's a player you can trade in. Dusty, do you go back to the well? I actually think it's a pretty safe type pick. Uh, Daniel, oh, this could be a make or break type pick, I think. But th there's just too many question marks here. Green, no. Old, I'm actually, I'm not going to say half keen. I'm a quarter keen on Dylan Moore. I'm a quarter keen. And I'm going to be doing a fair bit of research on him. I think I'm just going to lock this man in for now. It's Sam Flanders. Now, he is the next bloke. Oh, sorry. And that's the other thing I, I should have mentioned as well. With Gorn and Grundy, you're not getting great buys there. If you want to pay right up and go your English and your Marshall, then damn, you're paying up. You're paying a lot of coin there, but you're getting some really nice buys. I'm not getting the best here. But again, this is pretty much going with what I think will be the, the crowd or group think approach with Gorn and Grundy. I don't think it's there's any need to go too funky here. I don't think there's any need to go too funky with any premiums in your forward line either. Flanders may find his way out of my side. You know, who knows? Do I get, do I change it up? Do I simply bring, you know, a manner up to my forward line possibly and instead of Flanders, go with a Guthrie? Because the plan with Guthrie was always to, in my original idea anyway, start with a Guthrie and pretty much just before he has his buy, Brisbane will, will have had their two buys. You jump on a Neil if you like him or even better a Josh Dunkley. I could even jump on a Dunkley early. We'll see We'll see what happens. There's lots to play out. But uh, yeah, we'll see what happens with Flanders. But I just think that based off what he did last year, if that continues, he's going to be a fantastic pick and I can just get over the buy. This is where it starts to get a little bit hairy. And this is where I start to save a little bit of coin. A number of options here. Um, at this stage, I'm going to go with this bloke, just get him in. I'm going with a bloke that costs a little bit more than him purely as a placeholder, but Billings, I think for 243K, I think he's a bloke that can average 85, 90 for us. Now, they may be high expectations, but the bloke is talented. I know he cops it so much. Selected him over Bont and all the rest. And he hasn't had the most successful career from, well, from an AFL standpoint or a super coach standpoint, but at the price, he's too hard to, to pass up for me. I think with potentially a wing role, even that half forward role, I think he's the type of bloke who'd like him to deliver into that 50 for you. I think there's a role there and I think he could play it well. So at the price, I think he presents enough value. Now, so man, Scobie, this one's for you. Now, everyone, please don't shoot me down for this. Uh, I said that I learnt my lessons from last year, purely a placeholder. And I'll talk about the other options that I've got here, but five is not life, but five is in my side for now. Now, why is this? Get him in, get the bugger in. As I said, he's a little bit more than uh, than your Billings type, but he's a fantastic placeholder because this spot could be occupied by a number of people. All right, so this is all off the top of my head. Um, so you've got your Tom Lynch. Who knows what's going to happen there? You've got your James Jordan is another one. What's going to happen with that mid-time, if any? Inside, outside, who knows? Best 22, question marks. I did see a nice breakaway from stoppage highlight from him during the preseason at some stage. So don't know what's going to happen there. Um, Dev Rob, for example. Now, there's no point locking in a Dev Rob. We get to see what that role is going to be like for free in round zero. We know if he's going to be likely to get a price rise. It's the same as a Kitty Coleman as well. You can go down from a Stewart if need be. If he absolutely smashes it out of the park, who knows? You could go there. So that's why I'm not getting too caught up with this particular position at the moment. So don't shoot me down for five, but I'm not even going to say he's been killing the preseason, but Scobie, that's one for you, mate. Um, yeah, if you don't follow Ryan Daniels, Rhino Daniels on X, make sure that you do, because uh, I really respect that bloke and get some good news, uh, gives you the good goss coming out of WA. So from what people have been saying, he's flying and they see him more as a midfielder this year. Who knows what's going to happen with his body? Um, if you look at Williams, yeah. Uh, even a Gibkiss was out last year. Caulfield, not great. Uh, LDU is the only real bloke who I'm really paying up for with that dodgy durability. You could argue a corner running, maybe, probably not. Um, 
Billings, maybe Fife, definitely. But apart, as I said, from LDU, I don't feel that for the price that I'm paying, I'm taking a huge risk here. I think that's okay. So yeah, the, the short and long of it is that Fife is more of that placeholder at the moment. Got that DPP again, that I can switch up with a manner. So yeah, don't shoot me down for that one. But Nat Fife it is for now. The next bloke is going to be, I think, the highest owned player. Oh, what am I doing? In Supercoach. And it's an absolute no-brainer. The number one pick. I will be playing off halfback. He's moved to roll the uh, new version of Sheasel and Dacos before him. I don't know. I really don't care. Everyone's going to select him. No-brainer. Just like Harley Reid in your side for mine anyway. Uh, the next bloke we're going to go here is... Oh, I am not spelling at the moment. It's Darcy Wilson. So I think with Wilson, highly touted type player. Will he play around one? I'm not too sure, but I think he's got some decent junior numbers. And one of those blokes from now, particularly Pink being just that little bit more at 130K, always go down to 123K, even better at 117K if you can. So I sort of like his price, given that fact, and happy to hopefully have him on field. Now, the next bloke here, former number one pick. Thank you for this. Uh, no, Will Ashcroft. Got a bit of a bit more of a bargain there for Ashy as a Brisbane man. It's Aaron Cadman. So, again, hope, well, I'm not going to say preseason hype on him, but there has been a little bit, I suppose. Put on some more size, put on some more bulk, which is, I think, really important for him. Still a young man, a lot of expectation, but we know what it's like for key forwards. Given his early draw, he would be a great rookie loop to have when you can, or potentially chuck him on field instead of that Wilson, maybe get your five for your mana and then Cadman on for your mana. There's a lot you can do with this, but I like his early draw. So at this stage, Cadman is in my side. Now, to be quite honest, I forget who the last bloke was. 123K. Now, I have skipped Finn McRae. Usually he would be in here, but with that five placeholder, the easy thing is go down to a Jordan type or a, uh, a Dev Rob type, and then you bring Finn McRae in. So I don't mind Finn McRae as a pick. A few rookies that you could look to get. Look, who knows what's happening with Burgess? Oh, we know Himmelberg's going back to the Crows. Could Burgess fill that role? If something that happens with Himmelberg or if he doesn't really live up to expectations, Burgess is a bit of a swing man at a cheap price as well. So you could definitely look to go him depending on role. A lot of water to go under the bridge. But again, I think we're going to go with a bloke. Uh, he's from the Doggies. He is a former father-son and been playing well in the preseason. So he's going to be back, forward, back up, ruck. Probably not back up, ruck, I'd say, because I think Lob will be spending more time there, which again could be a slight downside to paying so much for Tim English. I really want to see what the split's going to be like there, the exact split. Remember in that last game, the combination works a lot better for the Bulldogs, not for Supercoach, I'm saying, when Lobb did spend a little bit more time there in English, was more of that key forward target. So we'll see what happens there. But Darcy, I think at the price at 123K, is fine just to have on your bench for now. So that is the team. That is the team. So uh, I won't lock it in yet, but let's talk again about what the structure is like. So we are going with 12 premiums here. The premiums, or the blokes I'm saying are premiums, a Sicily Stuart Young, there's three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, in the midfield with Bond, LDU, Butters Green, and Brayshaw. I'm saying 9 10 with your Gorn Grundy combination, and then 11 12 with your Flanders. Now, Flanders is at that price, it's under 500k. I said I wasn't really going between your four, 500k, but he's pretty much the second best option, or could even be the best option. Again, we'll wait and see on this. Uh, apart from McRae, I think McRae is just such a safe type pick, his super coach royalty. Who knows what could happen with maybe Baz going out. Maybe you'd argue Sanders plays more in there. Who knows? But I just think that they're pretty easy picks at this stage. So 12 of those guys. Then you go down to that sort of 200 to 300 range. You've got your Zach Williams. You've got your McKercher. Sanders just a little bit under that. You've got your Billings in that range. You've got Harley Reid. You've got Nat Fife as well. So a little bit could change there. Fife member is that real placeholder. A lot of other players that you could like to look to select there. Reid's a no-brainer. Wilson, that little bit of a higher price. Cadman and Darcy, more of those key forward type players. But all you need from these type of blokes, just say if they are a key forward like a Cadman, is a nice little bag early. And who's he going to get those bags against? Well, probably, or well, hopefully for my case, 
your North Melbournes and your West Coast types like they're playing early on. So it would be nice to see a little spike like that. We know that Tom Lynch is a key forward, even you could change him up for a five, has the potential to go really big. So yeah, that's uh, a bit on those blokes. And you've got your Manor, Clark, really don't know what's happening there from Geelong. Your Clay Hall, Sharp, I think it's a really easy one. I'm not going to say he's locked into the 22, but what I will say is it's definitely his spot to lose. Uh, probably who I'm missing here might be a Dan Curtin. Um, definitely missing a Dacos, but if you look at most of the blokes in the position, apart from McRae and Flanders, and even in saying this, I don't think that these blokes can hurt you. I would even look to even switch things up possibly. If Flanders isn't looking like he's going to get the role that we want, and it's more Miller that goes back to his old role, again, could you get a Tuki in the side? Possibly, but I could even swap out someone like a Flanders Try to aim for a Matty Crouch, an aim on type, even lower a Cam Guthrie, and just use some DPP and do it that way. If I need more money, downgrade your five. So that's pretty much my approach now. It may be wrong. It may be not the best way to go about it. But with these extra trades, obviously Tommy Green, and I'll be really taking this fixture into account. So I think that most of my premiums have a really nice buy. The Bulldogs, for example, have that round 15 buy. It's the last buy. Again, that's why I love a Libba. Uh, maybe a Sarong over a Brayshaw, I wouldn't mind. A Connor Rosie as a real pod. Even down back, a real pod, I think, could be a Jaden Short type. There's lots that could play out, but that is the team for now. I'm sure that I've absolutely rambled on. I'm not sure how deep I've sort of gone into strategy. I suppose another thing that I'll say is that I will be aggressive this year. If you think back to last year, if you followed me, I had Bruce left in the bank. It's not going to happen this year. Selby, who I had a great chat with, he's an aggressive type player. I'm going to take that approach. So boosts are going to be used early. Trades are going to be used early. I'm going to get pretty creative this year because I just want to have a red hot crack at getting back in that top 100. So uh, that is a team at the moment, guys. Uh, I suppose the other thing to mention quickly with those four trades is that what I'll be looking to do is to move on rookies a little bit earlier than what I would be. So instead of looking for that, say 150k cash gen with at least a couple of them maybe it's that 100k quick flip particularly if someone's looking really nice on the bubble usually you'd have that decision oh what do i do here do i just squeeze a little bit more out or waste a trade and get that hot guy in i'm just going to get that guy in i think and maybe lose 30k on a particular player but make some extra quick cash gen or some rapid cash gen with the guy that i bring in and make some money in the process so uh I've been getting calls left, right and centre here. Apologies if you are trying to contact me, guys. And my DMs at the moment have been absolutely smashed. Again, I promise I'll get back to them. So if I haven't got back to you guys, much love. I promise it's nothing personal. But uh, yeah, look, there'll be plenty more to come in the preseason. Lots of strategy talk. We're going to take a deep dive into every relevant player. And the best thing out of all is that there'll be great content creators who actually support the sides that they will be reviewing. So they've got the intri intricate knowledge which is going to be the best thing about it. Obviously, the swordplay potty, we're going to do um, a line-by-line -line potty for each one of those, and then just a couple of general ones on Spotify this year as well. Still on YouTube. We're always going to be more of a visual podcast, but we are going to cater for the wider audience as well. So uh, last thing I'll say, guys, is uh, be positive. For anyone that's new to the community, welcome. Uh, enjoy the game. Make sure that you get chatting with people. Follow some other content. Over the preseason, I'll be introducing some new content creators as well as giving a shout out to the blokes that I think you should look to for the best advice in the game. So that's it for now, guys. Much love. My voice is gone. Hope to see you soon. Let me know what you think. Cheers. See you later, guys. Bye.